Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm Victoria Cora Mitchell. In the news this week, in Downing Street, the leader of the government's partner is asked, be a poppet, nip out and get me a latte. <laughs> 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 Leaked footage from Downing Street reveals the real reason behind Lee Kane's resignation. <laughs> <laughs> and in Washington, Joe Biden heads to the streets with a clear message for the election protesters, but soon regrets not taking anyone with him. On Ian's team tonight is a comedian who loves going ten-pin bowling and is missing it at the moment. So tonight, for a special treat, he's wearing Ian's shoes. Please welcome <laughs> Finn Taylor. <laughs> and with Paul tonight is a TV presenter, Labour peer and one of those rarest of things, a dame who's working this Christmas. <laughs> Please welcome Joan Bakewell. <laughs> We begin with the bigger news stories of the week. Ian and Finn, have a look at this. Uh, this is humble servant of the people just waving away the elite. <laughs> uh, he's dressed casually, usually he's wearing a chicken suit. Ah, oh, catching crabs. <laughs> another poodle. And now they're applauding. Just clapping. And he's looking for divine guidance. <laughs> That's the crab in the box being led away. <laughs> <laughs> That's the final exit. Well, one doesn't want to gloat. <laughs> um, I don't think that would be appropriate. Dominic Cummings has been sacked and has lost his job. Uh, he's, he's been, been sacked, sacked and he's lost his job. <laughs> and he's been sacked <laughs> as well. <laughs> I mean, two, can you imagine, both happening at once? Where did that brown box come from? You're talking about Dominic Cummings leaving with a cardboard box. Yes, the cardboard box is always there. Is it like when you leave prison and you give them the clothes that you first arrived in in the box and you take them away again? <laughs> yeah, I was just a vision of Dominic Cummings going to prison there, which he isn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Apparently, the culture around him had got so toxic, his favourite gesture when he left the room was to pull the plug on an imaginary grenade and throw it behind him. Which is funny, because whenever he entered a room, everyone used to go... <laughs> <laughs> You'd think they'd have something better to do in Number 10, but this is an, an office politics spat, which obviously got out of hand, and... Um, it's basically about who should be the Prime Minister's new spokesman. I mean, why does Boris need a spokesman? Why can't the Prime Minister speak for himself? I mean, he's not, he's not any good at anything else, is he? Speaking was the thing he was meant to do. So Boris Johnson gave the job of Press Secretary to Allegra Stratton. He offered her the job and then she said, well, I'll only answer to you as Prime Minister, not to this man Lee Kane, <laughs> who's sort of the head of communications That's again. That's Bill Mitchell. What's he doing there? <laughs> they call him Kano. Very senders. <laughs> Leave it, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. You've Thank been you. working hard on that, haven't oh, you? Oh. <laughs> You've been talking to taxi drivers in your spare time. <laughs> the Prime Minister said, I can't not give the job to her because my girlfriend will be furious. Kane then said, how dare you? And then a briefing war started with the tiny group of people in this office all leaking stuff to journalists about each other, including unpleasant names. So one lot called him and Dominic Cummings the Mad Bullers, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they were briefing that Carrie Simmons, his girlfriend, was known as Princess Nut Nuts. <laughs> they're not the wittiest nicknames, are they? No, but they're still quite funny. <laughs> I don't know what you think, Joan. This idea that Boris Johnson is doing what his girlfriend tells him... I mean, this is a man who glided into Downing Street with this much younger woman that he hasn't married, while the woman he was married to, behind whose back he impregnated another woman, was having cancer treatment. This is not a man who's pushed around by women. He's not Andy Cap. <laughs> well, he, he is to a certain extent, because you obviously only have to put your way, yourself in his way and his yours. I mean, he obviously <laughs> he, he falls for any passing bit of skirt, as the phrase once was. <laughs> And one does wonder, just looking at the physique, what is so completely compelling about it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I th he must have a very good chat-up line, don't you think? Well, I'm the Prime Minister. Well... I've, have you got a comb? <laughs> <laughs> but it's so clearly misogynistic, isn't it? I mean, it's clearly the blokes 
in all their blokey ways, and the women standing for something like principle, possibly, or truthfulness, or sense of duty and all the virtues. Sense of duty? This is the woman <laughs> who had an affair with Boris behind his wife's back while she had cancer, Joan. Of course, we don't know that she knew that. No, we don't, nor do we know if she asked. <laughs> <laughs> it was the whole Brexit plan. We take away power from the unelected bureaucrats mm. and give it to the Prime Minister's girlfriend. It's so <laughs> pathetic. And then, in the end, Cummings and Kane, both of them, had to leave. That's the thing that's worrying, is that these two people, no matter how unpleasant they were, my understanding is they were the ones that were actually running the shop and that Boris is just a kind of vessel. So we seem to have ended up with this situation where our government is just like a, a steamed ham that's been hollowed out and we just stuffed it full of narcissistic twats. That seems to be... <laughs> <laughs> but it was like that when he was mayor. He likes winning competitions. He's not the only major politician in recent times to have uh, campaigned for the job that he doesn't want to do. Yeah. I mean, Trump at the moment in America is, is desperately trying to cling on to the job that he doesn't... that he's not doing. <laughs> but why? Why do they do that? Uh, so well, they in Trump's the... case, he doesn't want to go to prison. <laughs> <laughs> and in Boris's case, he doesn't want to go home. Yes. <laughs> no, that, that's exactly right. And I think Biden winning was just a sudden realisation that... Um... Well, well, it's a bit early to say Biden won, Ian. I mean, there's still a lot of, <laughs> a lot of counting to do. Well, we, uh, we will be talking about Trump later. So, Cummings has been inundated with job offers. What's he been asked to do? Specs over his advert? <laughs> You're quite close. Uh, turn on some Christmas lights somewhere. Where? Barna Castle. Yes. You've been invited to switch on the Barna Castle Christmas lights. <laughs> so Cummings is gone, but who has been let back into the bosom of the Labour Party? Jeremy Corbyn, of course. Mm. Jeremy Corbyn was let back in by a disciplinary panel after 19 days in exile. <laughs> although he's been refused the whip. What do we think of that? It's quite appropriate that he's not given the whip now because, because of the report, which and... found they behaved against the law. He broke the law. I feel like we had an opposition for 19 days and now it's over again because yeah. he just won't stay in his box. <laughs> it's like my relationship with Corbyn is like Bob Dylan in that I only hate him so much because of his fans. <laughs> in that people think Bob Dylan is the greatest musician that ever lived. And you go, OK, you listen to That's something. That's me. Mm -hmm. About me. Yeah, well, I, you listen to something, it's, it's awful. A, you know, a poet or whatever, but he's got a sinus infection, clearly. I mean, it's not, it's not nice to listen to. Him. But then people are so dogmatic and say he's the greatest musician. He won the Nobel Prize for literature. Yeah, literature, not singing, right? Well, and, <laughs> and so he's terrible. But people who like Corbyn, it's like, what? It's 200,000 people in the Labour Party that are fanatics. So all you've got to do next year... Bomb Glastonbury, hopefully Dylan's headlining, two birds, one stone. <laughs> well, that's the end of your career. Yeah. Oh, oh my week on Twitter next week's going to be lovely. <laughs> I, all I was going to say is I just think you, you have to say hats off to the Labour Party. The week that the Tory party is in full civil war mode, pulling itself apart, you let Corbyn back into the Labour Party. Brilliant. Focus off. Tories let off hook again. <laughs> Well, you say Tories let off, but who else has been accused of spreading fear in the government? Oh, Pretty Patel. She was being investigated for bullying in her department um, and being unpleasant to civil servants, and they've come up with a report that says, oh, I don't know, something like inappropriate behaviours... But what, some of it's... Plural. Bullying, whether intentional or not. Or not. Yes, and a source told the BBC that Patel failed to treat civil servants with consideration and respect. Mark Sedwell said there could be a wide range of sanctions. Surprising, isn't it? Because she seems so nice. <laughs> <laughs> this is the departure of Dominic Cummings from Number 10, probably the most hated man in the news last week. And let's not forget this was week when Peter Sutcliffe died. <laughs> <laughs> According to the Daily Telegraph, as Lee Kane left Number 10 for the last time, colleagues followed the old Downing Street tradition of banging on the desk. Coincidentally, that's also how Boris and Carrie celebrated. <laughs> <laughs> Amid claims of a macho culture at number 10, The Sun reported female advisers are accused of leaking more than men. Well, that can happen once you've had kids. <laughs> <laughs> Paul and Joan, yes. look at this. Oh, hooray, hooray. 
We've won the vaccine race. Well, if anybody can fuck it up, it's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's good news. By the summer of next year, maybe this will all be a distant memory for us. I've never been so glad to be old. It puts me at the, towards the front of the queue. I'll take anything they give me, I tell you. I'll offer, I'll offer to be a guinea pig. I'll try it, as long as they just don't give me the placebo. No, that's no good. I wouldn't like that. No, that's been around for a long time, that one. <laughs> I shall be elbowing my way to the front, certainly. I'd be prepared to push Prince Philip out of the way to get to the front. <laughs> he can't have much muscle tone left, surely. There are several vaccines. There's the Pfizer and BioNTech, which claims 90% effectiveness. Yes. Moderna claims 95%. Yes. And the Russians are claiming 92% for honest Vlad's very good Jabsky. Yes. <laughs> I'm not down, going to Russia. What, we... <laughs> <laughs> what was fishy about the announcement from Pfizer? Well, it wasn't fishy. It was just it came after the American election had been decided. What did Donald Trump say about that? Well, he said it was fishy because it was after the American election hadn't been decided. <laughs> <laughs> That's his logic, isn't it? Yes. Um, he said, if this vaccine had been developed a few weeks earlier, <laughs> I would have won the election, which I did. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's the problem with the Pfizer vaccine? The it's the problem? thing about it being refrigerated to a very cold temperature. It has it's to... got to be colder than it is at the Arctic, isn't it? Yes. I mean, it's just so cold. I don't know how you And get how people are going to get to the Arctic on their own back. <laughs> <laughs> I think people were quite confused as to why there were so many, but according to my aunt on Facebook, the <laughs> Pfizer one gives you autism, the Moderna one makes you infertile, and the Oxford one is the microchip to track us all. So... <laughs> Right. That it up. But we haven't got enough of the other ones anyway. I think the Pfizer and the Moderna, we didn't order enough. Whereas Donald Trump did. Yes. He was quite good, really, wasn't he? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the problem with this story is it's just such fantastic news. No one really knows how to react. Mm. So you watch the papers and, and broadcasters and they're going, well, uh, the world's been saved. After all, we thought we'd be uh, with this uh, virus forever and life would be thoroughly miserable. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's quite a low temperature in the fridge, though. <laughs> uh, really. Who did a lot to help develop the Moderna vaccine? Dolly Parton. It was Dolly Parton. Oh, yeah. I told you, it's all good news. Yeah. She gave a million dollars to the Moderna vaccine project. And what else impressed Dolly Parton in the last few days? Something to do with Chris Packham. She a fan of Autumn Watch. Well, here she is on The One Show. Hi, I'm impressed with your Hedgehog Highway. I tell you, that subdivision is more important than any we got here in Nashville. That's <laughs> impressive. Oh. I must say, what magnificent baubles. She is um, <laughs> impressed with the Hedgehog Highway. And what has a National Audit Office report revealed about the government's <laughs> early attempts oh. to combat the virus? Well, this is the uh, coronavirus scandal. This is the contracts amounting to billions of pounds. And it went to a lot of people who didn't have any qualifications. And apparently, I didn't know this, but you could, if you were an MP or a peer, fast track a friend of yours who thought they could manage such a company and they would profit by many millions of pounds without any competitive tendering. By Under Capital, that's an investment firm, they got a £250 million contract to supply face masks with loops, which the NHS said weren't good enough. And their advisor, Andrew Mills, used to work at the Department of International Trade, run by Liz Truss, so that was fast-tracked. There was a jewellery designer in Florida who got something like £200 million because he said he could supply the goods. All he had was a lot of trading contacts in China, which is apparently where a lot of this equipment comes from. Do you design jewellery, Paul? No, but I'm quite willing to take it up if that's what I'm no. <laughs> <laughs> Why is Boris Johnson in isolation? He's got an app that tells him whenever he's been near one of his children. <laughs> <laughs> Who has he been near? He had a meeting with, I think it was six or seven MPs. None of them wore masks. They were in Downing Street. One of them went down with the virus and he now has to isolate. Here he is standing next to Lee Anderson. But you just go, come on, you're the Prime Minister, people are taking pictures, why don't you mm. just stand two metres apart? How difficult is it? Boris Johnson says that he's bursting with antibodies <laughs> and he has had a negative test. That was an IQ test, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Moving away from Westminster, even without isolation, lockdown two is starting to affect people. Let's see this chap in Burnley. Excuse me, sir, sorry to bother you. 
Can we just ask you how happy you're feeling right now? I'm bloody miserable, actually. <laughs> what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> this is the news that a number of effective COVID vaccines are on the horizon. The World Health Organization's Regional Director for Europe said that this year's festive season will be a different Christmas, but that does not mean it cannot be a merry one. Well, that's all very well coming from someone with a key to the morphine cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> one of the vaccines is made by Pfizer, and it's very much in their interest to keep men over 70 alive, as they also make Viagra. <laughs> The Tories have been accused of giving billions of pounds worth of PPE contracts to their friends in what's been called a chumocracy. Perhaps a good topic for the Prime Minister's new spokeswoman, Allegra Stratton, who's godmother to the daughter of Rishi Sunak, who was best man at Allegra's wedding to the political editor of The Spectator, where Boris used to be editor. <laughs> <laughs> And so to round two, the picture spin quiz. Fingers on buzzers, teams. Yes, this is uh, Joe Biden, who is uh, waiting to become the president in January. And Trump is in a position where he can't lie, cheat, steal, bribe or bully his way out of a losing situation. And apparently this is driving him mad. <laughs> and uh, he's locked himself away. He's not come out of the White House. He sits there every day just watching television, fuming, sacking people. He doesn't care about other people and he doesn't care about, as I was saying earlier, in the uh, bit that was edited out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's desperately fighting to keep the job that he doesn't want to do. And who has he fired this week? He's fired this man, Krebs, who's in charge of counting the votes. It's extraordinary, isn't it? He's head of cyber security. Mm. He sends him out with the authority to check on all these claims, these legal situations, and come back with the answer. And Krebs comes back and says, no, there was no fault, there was no corruption. So he sacks him. Yeah. <laughs> this would embarrass the, you know, the average banana republic. Mm. But it would embarrass the average banana. <laughs> <laughs> they need the word republic on the end of that sentence. According to the BBC, the agency security chief only learned he was out of a job when he saw the president's tweet. Wow. How shit a spy is he? <laughs> also, I don't think he cares um, if this, he pushes the country towards a sort of civil war. The crazy boys, or whatever they were called, were told to stand by. The crazy, crazy boys. boys? What were they called? The Osmonds. <laughs> <laughs> Proud boys. What did the televangelist Kenneth Copeland do to show his support for Trump? He laughed. He laughed. Yeah. Here it is. The media said Joe Biden's president. Ha 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 
The show's portrayal of Prince Charles' <laughs> fishing <laughs> technique was utterly unjustifiable. <laughs> what did Prince William announce this week? He's happy about the investigation into how Bashir got the interview. The BBC, having had an inquiry earlier on looking into itself and to see whether um, Martin Bashir or anyone on Panorama had behaved badly at the time, um, decided that no one had. But now it's all come out again. You'd think this time they could interview Martin Bashir, um, but he's very ill. He's got a form of COVID that requires you to eat curry and go to the off-licence, which is quite a serious one. <laughs> um, so he's... I'm afraid he can't answer any questions. So he's not as, as ill as we've been told? Um, judging by the pictures of him out and about, no. Right. And I think it's very convenient for everybody that he can't answer these questions. Ironically, those pictures are forged. <laughs> <laughs> and what was Tony Hall's role in it? He well, was, he was head, head of news, news mm -hmm. at the time. And did you were know... probably there, Joan. Hmm? Was it your fault? No, it wasn't. Oh. Um, it does interest me that Martin Bashir is now head of religious broadcasting and ethics. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Netflix series that's been accused of showing the royal family in a bad light. Let's be honest, it's just a glossy soap opera full of cartoonish characters that we shouldn't take seriously. But it is good source material for The Crown. Diana's <laughs> <laughs> former butler, Paul Burrell, defended the series on Good Morning Britain, saying, you can't just take one thing from The Crown. Well, you didn't, did you, Paul? <laughs> you loaded up half of Anne's work. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers on buzzers, team. Mm. Well, of course, this is a statue by Maggie Hamling, uh, put up to remember Mary Wollstonecraft. But this has come in from a lot of disapproval because uh, Maggie Hamling rather likes that. She creates statues that always cause a bit of a stir. This presumably, I think, because it shows pubic hair in a statue, which is not often done. Can we just take a slightly closer look at the old uh, Hedgehog's Highway? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> that is... I mean, it is a bit curious looking. It's how women look. Is it? Do, do you... <laughs> I don't think I've ever been close enough, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of that statue? I've only seen it in articles saying how terrible it is. So my impulse is to defend it. Um, I, li I like Maggie Hamlin's work as a watercolourist. She's a brilliant painter. Didn't she um, do that statue of Cristiano Ronaldo with the, uh, the ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> One critic said that it looks like someone stuck a Barbie doll on top of a kebab. <laughs> <laughs> I like the comment from someone saying, well, you can judge a statue by thinking what they would have done with a a male, and it's very rare that you see Thomas Paine, for example, totally naked. To quote the writer Tracy King, you don't get to see an artist's impression of Nelson Mandela's cock and balls <laughs> in a <laughs> So, you know, that would give meaning to the slogan, free Nelson Mandela. <laughs> <laughs> Who else was in the running to do the statue of Mary Wollstonecraft? Tommy Steele. <laughs> Yeah, do you know, it, it might have been Tommy Steele. All I know is that there, there were two people in the running and the other one was a man. Oh. But that would have been wrong too, wouldn't it? I think it would have been a bit strange to get a man to make the statue in tribute to Mary Wollstonecraft. No, I think you just get a good sculptor myself. But then I'm not very woke about that. I'm sure there are people who feel only women should make statues of women, only men should make statues of men and... Only horses should make statues of horses. <laughs> <laughs> What has Turkmenistan unveiled the giant statue of this week? It's a giant statue of a dog. Yes. And it was made by a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was, but let's have a look it at it. It was. <laughs> and why have they done that? He's a good boy. <laughs> it's the favourite breed of Turkmenistan's president. In other news, what does the Japanese town of Takikawa put in the woods to scare off bears? A toilet that doesn't flush properly. <laughs> no, it's a robot wolf. Let's see it. Any self respecting oh, No, oh. it's two different bits of footage altogether. <laughs> Taken at different times of the day, I can tell you that for a start. <laughs> what is this, any, the crown? Yeah, any, any bear looking at that wolf will say, why has he had a Zimmer frame shoved up his ass? <laughs> <laughs> That'll scare anybody. This is the new statue of feminist icon Mary Wollstonecraft. 
for anyone watching under the age of 25, that's what pubic hair used to look like. <laughs> <laughs> Time now for the Missing Words Round, which this week features as its guest publication, Historical Diving Times, a magazine of the British Historical Diving Society. The readership is going down slowly. <laughs> and we start with... Keir Starmer reveals on Desert Island Discs that he used to... what? Enjoy life. <laughs> <laughs> Be against euthanasia? <laughs> Be a rabbi. <laughs> I know this. He used to live above a massage parlour. Correct. He used to live above a massage parlour. I had the flat then? next door. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me get this right. You were working in the, in the flat below. <laughs> Keir Starmer revealed that he used to live above a massage parlour. My family were really embarrassed, said a masseuse. <laughs> <laughs> next. People often ask me what the difference is between the Swedish Historical Diving Society and the Historical Diving Society of Sweden. I simply tell them what? I simply tell them, stop talking to me or I'll call the police. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't any difference at all. They're both the same thing. I'm going to give you the point. Yes. I would have preferred the wording... I simply we... tell them that the SDHF was filmed in 1979. And when the HDS came into being, what was HDS Sweden simply adopted the original name. Yeah. The HDS was, of course, founded in 1990. <laughs> so if you've done your sums properly, that makes the SDHF some 11 years older. Although none of this matters, as they are now both incorporated into the same society, and so the answer is there is no difference between the Swedish Historical Diving Society and the Historical Diving Society. <laughs> in terms of missing words questions that we've had, that one is certainly the best. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, it's from the Historical Diving Times. That magazine will win an award one day, but don't hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, dog regrets attacking office stationery after what? It got a bit too uh, big-headed after a statue of itself was unveiled. <laughs> <laughs> after we sick into a bucket. Uh, <laughs> after he swallows a stapler and oh. finds all his internal organs linked. Oh, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> I mean, it is quite ridiculous. Dog regrets attacking office stationery after biting into ink cartridge and turning itself blue. <laughs> Here's what Rosie ended up looking like. <laughs> it's Mel Gibson. Mel, it's Mel. He's doing an impression of Mel Gibson. He's, he's being Scottish. Freedom. <laughs> so the final scores are Ian and Finn have six points, Paul and Joan have seven. Well done, Joan. Well done. Before we go, there's just time for the caption competition. <laughs> uh, office workers question new government PPE contracts. <laughs> uh, is she saying how much longer are you going to keep that invisible budgie on your finger? <laughs> <laughs> on which note, we say thank you to our panellists, Ian Hislop and Finn Taylor, Paul Merton and Joan Bakewell. And I leave you with news that at number 10, as Boris Johnson celebrates getting rid of Dominic Cummings and his bully boy culture, there's an ominous knock at the door. <laughs> Reports are coming in that after stealing the show on last weekend Strictly, Prince Harry's internet's gone down and won't be fixed for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and as the waiting drags on to the point of awkwardness, it looks like Emmanuel Macron's pet kestrel is not coming back. <laughs> Just done my budgie joke. Just done the budgie joke. <laughs> You've had, you've had writers have seen, oh, that's a good joke. Right, quick, find somebody with his hands sticking out. Macron, Macron, budgie, can't do budgie, can't do kestrel, yeah, begins with a K, funny K, put it in, give it to you, then you cut out my joke. <laughs> good night. Good night, yeah, oh, good night. Always plenty of material to go round. Press red now to join Dara O'Brien and Hugh Dennis through iPlayer as they mock the week. But coming up, remember those lazy Sundays. Nice roast and a spot of Hugh Scully. Reminisce with the royal family. Next. <laughs>